Hello and welcome to this continuing first look exploring session looking at Eastward Ho by Ben Johnson, George Chapman and John Marston. Last time uh, when we <coughs> opened in Act 1 we were mostly probably in the area of John uh, Marston and Ben Johnson. Um, maybe more a little sprinkling of Johnson over your Marston. Uh, and, then, uh, and then much more into a, a Chapman territory. Uh, we were much more in favour of the Marston-Johnson uh, combo. Um, there, was, there was more life to it. Um, but um, maybe we got bogged down in <coughs> plot last time uh, at, uh, towards the latter end of Act 2 uh, when the, 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 the evildoers got on with doing some evil plotting. Uh, in this satire um, so yeah we're going to continue from act 3 scene 2 scene uh, numbers do vary depending on edition but that looks pretty firm uh, in pretty much anyone you'll be looking at and so a uh, reading today uh, Quicksilver is hello my name is Lynn Freitas um, I'm a college composition teacher I live in the northwestern United States uh, reading uh, Sindify, Scrivener, Scape Thrift, and First Gent is. Hello, I'm Aligi Chapel, actor and translator, currently in Athens. Uh, reading A Coachman and Sir Petronel Flash is. Me, Alan, driving in Suffolk. Uh, reading Hamlet and Security is. Sarah Blake, Chile in Germany. Reading Gazer, Mildred, and Spendall is... Carolyn, even chillier in Bristol. Reading Mistress Touchstone, Seagull, and Slitgut <clears throat> is... Uh, I'm Alex Scott Fairley. I'm an actor and I'm in Perthshire, so I win on the cold front. <laughs> uh, reading Gertrude and Winifred is... Uh, Lois Potter, retired academic in London. Uh, reading Potkin and Drora is... Julie Hoverson. I'm a podcast uh, dramatist and uh, actor uh, and audio dramas on online. Uh, and reading in uh, Seattle. Oh, and reading <laughs> Fond, Golding, Bramble, and Second Gent is. Hi, I'm Eric. I am here. Trying not to uh. scream. Yes, uh, uh, and I too am here. I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I'll be reading Stage Directions uh, as we go forward into Act 3, Scene 2. So without further ado, Act 3, Scene 2. Enter a coachman in haste in his frock, feeding. Just uh, when citizens ride out of town, indeed, as if all the house were up the fire. It's like they will knock him down and leave it to eat his breakfast before he rises. Enter Hamlet, a footman in haste. My lady's coming. My ladyship's ready to come down. Enter Potkin, a tankard bearer. Swat! Hamlet, are you mad? Whither run you now? You should brush up my old mistress. Enter Cindify. What? Potkin, you must put off your tankard and put on your blue coat and wait upon Mistress Touchstone into the country. And exit Cindify. I will forsooth presently. Exit Potkin. Enter Mistress Fond and Mistress Gazer. Come, sweet Mistress Gazer. Let's watch here and see my lady Flash take the coach. On my word, here's a most fine place to stand in. Did you see the new ship launch last day, Mistress Fond? Oh, God, and we citizens should lose such a sight. I warrant here will be double as many people to see her take coach as there were to see it take water. No, oh, she's married to the most fine castle in the country, they say. But there are no giants in that castle, are there? Oh, no. They say her knight killed them all, and therefore he was knighted. Would to God her ladyship would come away. She Enter, Gertrude, <laughs> Mistress Touchstone, Cindify, Hamlet, and Potkin. She comes, she comes, she comes. Pray heaven, bless, Pray your, heaven ladyship. bless your ladyship. Uh, thank you, good people. Uh, my coach, for the love of heaven, my coach. In good truth, I shall swoon else. Ah. Coach, coach, my lady's coach. Exit Mistress Fonda, Mistress Gazer, Hamlet and Potkin. As I am a lady, I think I am with child already. I long for a coach so. <laughs> May one be with child afore they are married, mother? Aye, by our lady, madam. A little thing does that. 
Uh, I have seen a little prick bigger than a pin's head swell bigger and bigger till it has come to an ancome, and e'en so tis in these cases. Enter Hamlet. Your coach is coming, modern. That's well said. Now, heaven, methinks I mean up to the knees in preferment, uh, but a little higher, but a little higher. But a little higher, there, there, there lies Cupid's fire. <laughs> but must this young man, please you, madam, run by your coach all the way afoot? Aye, by my faith, I warrant him. He gives no other milk, as I have another servant does. Alas, tis he in pity, methinks. For God's sake, madam, buy him but a hobby horse. Let the poor youth have something betwixt his legs to ease him. Alas, we must do as we would be done to. Now go to, hold your peace, dame. You talk like an old fool, I tell you. Enter Sir Petronel and Quicksilver. Will that be gone, sweet honeysuckle, before I can go with thee? Oh, I pray thee, sweet knight, let me. I do so long to dress up my castle afore thou comest. Uh, I marvel how my modest sister occupies herself this morning, that she cannot wait on me to my coach as well as her mother. Madam, Mary, madam, she's married by this time to Princess Golding. Your father and some one more stole to church with them in all haste that the cold meat left at your wedding might serve to furnish their nuptial table. Ah, there's no base fellow, my father, now. <sighs> but he's e'en fit to father such a daughter. Uh, he must call me daughter no more now. Uh, but madam, and please you, madam, and please your worship, madam, in indeed. Out upon him, marry his daughter to a base prentice. What should one do? Is there no law for one that marries a woman's daughter against her will? Well, how shall we punish him, madam? As I am a lady, and it would snow, we'd so pebble him with snowballs as they come from church. But, uh, Sarah, Frank, Quicksilver? Aye, madam. Just remember, since thou and I clapped, uh, what you call it, in the garret? I do not know. I know not what you mean, madam. Uh, his head as white as milk, all flaxen was his hair. Ah, but now he is dead and laid in his bed and never will come again. Um, God be at your labour. Enter Touchstone Golding Mildred with Rosemary. <clears throat> was there ever such a lady? See, madam, the bride and bridegroom. God's my precious. Uh, God give you joy, mistress. What lack you? Now out upon me baggage. My sister married in a taffeta hat. Marry, hang you. Westward with a onion to ye. Nay, I've done with your minion then, your faith. Never look to have my countenance any more, nor anything I can do for thee. Thou ride in my coach, or come down to my castle. Fie upon thee. I charge thee in my ladyship's name, Call me sister no more. I've not given out a touchstone. Who's not in this scene? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> oh, go for it. <laughs> okay. And please, your worship, this is not your sister. This is my daughter, and she calls me father, and so does not your ladyship, and please, your worship, madam. Uh, no, nor she must not call thee father by heraldry, because thou makest thy prentice thy son as well as she. Oh, thou misproud prentice, darest thou presume to marry a lady's sister? It pleased my master for sure to embolden me with his favour, and though I confess myself so far unworthy so worthy a wife, being in part her servant as I am your prentice, yet since I may say without boasting, I am born a gentleman. And by the trade of learned of my master, which I trust taints not my blood, able with my own industry and portion to maintain your daughter, I my hope is heaven will so bless my humble, our humble beginning, that in the end shall be no disgrace to the grace with which my master has bound me in his double prentice. Master me no more, son, if thou thinkst me worthy to be thy father. Son, <laughs> now, good Lord, how he shines, and you mark him. He's a gentleman. <laughs> I indeed, madam, a gentleman born. Never stand on your gentry, Master Bridegroom, if your legs be no better than your arms. 
You'll be able to stand up right on neither shortly. And uh, please your good worship, sir, there are two sorts of gentlemen. What mean you, sir? Bold to put off my hat to your worship. Nay, pray for bear, sir, and then forth with your two sons, sorts of gentlemen. If your worship will have it so, I say there are two sorts of gentlemen. There is a gentleman artificial and a gentleman natural. Now, though your worship be a gentleman natural, and work upon that now. Well said, old Touchstone. I am proud to hear thee enter such a set speech. In faith, forth, I beseech thee. Cry your mercy, sir. Your worship's a gentleman I do not know. If you be one of my acquaintance, you're very much disguised, sir. Go to, old Quipper. Forth with thy speech, I say. What, sir? My speech? speeches were ever in vain to your gracious worship, and therefore, till I speak to you gallantry indeed, I will save my breath for my broth anon. Come, my poor son and daughter, let us hide ourselves in our poor humility and live safe. Ambition consumes itself with the very show. Work upon that now. Let him go. Let him go, for God's sake. Let him make his prentice his son, for God's sake. Give away his daughter, for God's sake. And when they come a-begging to us, for God's sake, let's laugh at their good husbandry, for God's sake. Farewell, sweet knight. Pray thee, make haste after. I say, I would not have thee go. Now, oh, now, I must depart, <coughs> parting though it absence move. This ditty night do I see in thy looks in capital letters what a grief tis to depart and leave the flower that has my heart. My sweet lady in alack for woe, why should we part so? Tell truth, night, and shame all dissembling lovers. Does not your pain lie on that side? If it do, canst thou tell me how I may cure it? Excellently easy. Divide yourself in two halves, just by the girdle stead. Send one half with your lady and keep t'other yourself, or else do as all two lovers do. Part with your heart and leave your body behind. I have seen it done a hundred times. Tis as easy a matter for a lover to part with a heart from his sweetheart and ne'er the worse, and he ne'er the worse, as for the a mouse to get from a trap and leave her tail behind. Fear come the writings. I'm going to pause there because this is a very busy scene uh, with a lot going on. Um, uh, a lot that is possibly not really to do with the play. Um, <laughs> and some bits that definitely are. Um, just going to randomly hold this item in my hand for the rest of this uh, this particular interjection. Don't go there. <laughs> Alan, then Aliki, then Lois. Yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely back into boys' company uh, territory, aren't we, with the beginning of that scene? No entendre un unknowingly undoubled. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 there were quite a few coming coming thick, thick and fast there. And, and, and it doesn't help. You've, you've got Gertrude who only talks in double entendres at times, and probably unknowingly. So it's when, when the person just goes, I don't know what you mean. It's, it's, <laughs> which means it's, it's, it's just going, I'm not sure which do. Where am I going with this 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 dialogue? Anyway, uh, Aliki. <laughs> Um, Sarah was talking about Jane Austen yesterday, and I can certainly see her prefigured here, as well as, as uh, a prefigured Dickens. There's all of this kind of pretension and silliness and comic business of in and out. It's just hilarious. I love it. Well, uh, Lois may be able to give more chapter and verse on this, but uh, this this play does have a, a, a survival uh, in adaptation pretty pretty constantly, actually, uh, over over the, the the following decades and centuries. So um, maybe bits of this, in fact, uh, did did bounce in their general direction uh, uh, to a theatre uh, near them. Um, uh, Lois, then uh, Sarah. Yeah, I wanted to point out a sort of plot thing because it's actually rather cleverly done here. What uh, what Quicksilver and Petronel are really anxious for is for Gertrude not to run off to the castle, but to stay until security arrives because mm -hmm. he's bringing this thing that she's got to sign. And uh, 
that's why, um, and, and Gertrude just can't wait to get off and see the castle and ride in her new coach. So that's why a lot of what Quicksilver was saying there is just double talk. I mean, Petronil says at one point, what shall I say? And I think he's not as bright or not as fluent as Quicksilver, and he just can't think of much to say to keep her there. And that's why Quicksilver goes babbling on <laughs> all this nonsense until finally, you know, that line, see, God, here comes the writing, thank God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Endless sort of de desperate vamping. Um, uh, Sarah? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're definitely back in Austin territory here, which makes me think we're probably back in Marston territory. Um, at least I wonder. All, all of a sudden, um, we've gone back to those really great characterizations those those characters that are observed with so few strokes um you know i mean just the the little exchange with the coachman and um and the footman at the beginning but i i, I mean it, hardly any lines but just so much bounce and character in there you know the, this kind of observational style of writing dialogue that's rooted in character we, we seem to it seemed to go astray in the second half of uh, the first session but we seem to be back so i'm i'm assuming that we're back into marston um uh, territory here maybe chapman was uh, uh, you you are you are not uh, in in uh, uh, absent of company on that opinion I think okay it's, uh, fair to say though Good it is a know. little more complicated than that um but yes uh, there, there may be a teensy weensy little bit of uh, marston bouncing about in there uh or in fact possibly quite a lot uh anyway uh eric but yeah, a bit about my my daughter married the taffeta hat. How dare they? Um, <laughs> yes. It's it's very very Marston-y, um sort of like from um, you know uh, Mackerel sort of coming in to advise people on like their fashion choices. Mm. Uh, other authors are available. Uh, uh, other thoughts. Uh, I say it's very busy. There, there is plot stuff going on throughout this, even though there are bits, you know, that 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 are, are are just for the fun of it, an extension of character and playing around with those things. Um, but yeah, it it, it does definitely it's 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 a good start to the session, isn't it? So whereas last session we sort of felt we got a bit bogged down and there were some some very unfortunate sections. Um, whereas now it's 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 we're back into that area where we, we, we which we were enjoying last time. Um, so uh, any other thoughts? Otherwise, we'll continue the scene because I paused it mid mid flow. Uh, Eric. Also, the bits like sort of by Mistress Touchstone, uh, who sort of has all these as not quite asides, but um, sort of like yes. But uh, I'll tell you what he has between his legs. So just give him something to do. Yeah, um, <laughs> sort of uh, all that was very. Um, it feels very Panto esque almost. Yeah, and it's an interesting question: how much the characters know their double entendre? Which characters know their double entendre, and which ones don't? Which ones are the just double entendre, and everybody else is feeling a bit awkward? Um, you know, and that's a very important question as to what the joke is supposed to be at that point, uh, in terms of the, what the characters are doing. Lois. Yeah, I think it's kind of a standard thing in, in the drama of this period for women. You know, women are all so uneducated that they just keep coming out with these obscene remarks without knowing what they're saying. I mean, I think that really is the uh, the basic joke. Uh, and both Gertrude and her mother do it a lot. Whereas I've had to spend an entire lifetime studying. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, right, let us crack on uh, as uh, Quicksilver manages to get an in-breath because finally enter security with a Scrivener. Good morrow to my worshipful lady. I present your ladyship with this writing, to which, if you please to set your hand with your knights, a velvet gown shall attend your journey, or my credit. Ooh, what writing is it, knight? Well, sweetheart, at the poor tenement I told thee of, only to make a little money to send thee down furniture for my castle, which my hand shall need thee. Oh, very well. And now, uh, give me your pen, I pray. It goes down without chewing, in faith. Your worships deliver this as your deed. We, we do. do. So, now, knight, farewell till I see thee. All farewell to my sweetheart. God be with you, son knight. Farewell, my good mother. Uh, farewell, Frank. Uh, I would fain take thee down if I could. 
I thank your good ladyship. Uh, farewell, Mistress Cinderfy. Exuant Gertrude Scrivener, Touchstone, Mistress Touchstone, Golding, Mildred Cinderfy. Tedious voyage, whereof there is no end. What will they think of me? Think what they list. They longed for a vagary into the country, and now they are fitted. So a woman marry a, to ride in a coach, she cares not if she ride to her ruin. Tis the great end of many of their marriages. This is not the first time a lady has rid a false journey in her coach, I hope. Nay, tis no matter. I care little what they think. He that weighs men's thoughts has his hands full of nothing. A man in the course of this world should be like a surgeon's instrument, work in the wounds of others and feel nothing himself. The sharper and the subtler, the better. As it falls out now, Knight, you shall not need to devise excuses or endure her outcries when she returns. We shall now be gone before, where they cannot reach us. Well, my kind compere, you now have the assurance we both can make you. Let me now entreat you. The money we agreed on may be brought to the Blue Anchor, near to Billingsgate, by six o'clock, where I and my chief friends, bound for this voyage, will, with feasts, attend you. Uh, the money, my most honourable compere, shall without fail observe your appointed hour. Thanks, my dear gossip. I must now impart to your approved love a loving secret, as one on whom my life doth more rely and friendly trust than any man alive, nor shall you be the chosen secretary of my affections for affection only. For I protest, if God bless my return, to make you partner in my actions gain, as deeply as if you'd ventured with me half of my expenses. Now then, honest gossip, I've enjoyed with such divine contentment a gentleman woman's bed whom you well know, that I shall ne'er enjoy this tedious voyage, nor live the least part of the time it asketh without her presence. So I thirst and hunger to taste the dear feast of her company. And if the hunger and the thirst you vow, as my sworn gossip to my wished good, be, as I know it is, unfeigned and firm, do me an easy favour in your power. Be sure, brave gossip, all that I can do to my best nerve is wholly at your service. Who is the woman first that is your friend? The woman is your learned counsel's wife. The lawyer, Master Bramble, whom would you bring out it this even in an honest neighbourhood to take his leave with you, me your gossip? I, in the meantime, will send this, my friend, home to his house to bring his wife disguised before his face into our company. For love hath made her look but for such a while to fear from his tyrannous jealousy. And I would take this course before another in stealing her away to make a sport and gull his circumspension the more grossly. And I am sure that no man like himself hath credit with him to entice his jealousy. To so long stay abroad as may give time to her enlargement in such safe disguise. A pretty pithy, a most pleasant project. Who would not strain a point of neighbourhood for such a point device? That as the ship of famous Draco went about the world, will wind about the lawyer, compassing the world himself. He hath it in his arms, and that's enough for him, without his wife. A lawyer is ambitious and his head cannot be praised nor raised too high with any folk of highest knavery. I'll go fetch her, straight. And exit security. So, so. Now, Frank, go thou home to his house, instead of his lawyer's, and bring his wife hither, who, just like to the lawyer's wife, is prisoned with his stern, usurious <laughs> jealousy, which he could never be overreached thus, but with overreaching re-enter security and master francis watch you the instant time to enter with his exit <laughs> twill be rare two fine horned beasts a camel and a lawyer how the old villain joys in villainy and hark you gossip when you have her here have your boat ready 
Shipper to your ship with utmost haste, lest Master Bramble stay you to o'erreach that head that outreacheth all heads. Oh, tis a trick rampant, tis a very quibbling. I hope this harvest to pitch cart with lawyers, their heads will be so forked. Sly touch will get apes to invent a number such. Exit security. Was ever a rascal honeyed so with poison? He that delights in slavish hours is apt to joy in every sort of vice. Well, I'll go fetch his wife whilst he the lawyers. Stay, Frank. Let's think how we may disguise her upon this sudden. Ah, oh, God's me, there's the mischief. But hark you, here's an excellent device. For God, a rare one. I will carry her a sailor's gown and cap and cover her and a player's beard. And what upon her head? I tell you, a sailor's cap. It's like, God forgive me, what kind of fidget memory have, fidget memory have you? Nay then, what kind of fidget whisk hast thou? Sailor's cap? How should she put it off when thou presents her to the company? Tush, man, for that, make her a saucy sailor. Tush, tush, there's no fit sauce for such sweet mutton. I know not what to advise. Enter security with his wife's gown. Night, night, a rare device. Thrones yet again. What stratagem have you now? The best that ever. You talk of disguising. I marry gossip. That's our present care. Cast care away, then. Here's the best device, the plain security, for I am no better. I think that ever lived. Here's my wife's gown, which you may put upon the lawyer's wife, and which I brought you, sir, for two great reasons. One is that Master Bramble may take hold of some suspicion that it is my wife, and gird me so perhaps with his law wit. The other, which is policy indeed, is that my wife may now be tied at home, having no more but her old gown abroad, and not show me a quirk while I fuck others. <laughs> is this not rare? Ah, the the best best ever ever was. Was. Am I not born to furnish gentlemen? Oh, my dear gossip. Well, old Master Francis, watch when the lawyer's out and put it in. And now I will go fetch him. Exit security. Oh, my dad. He goes through at the devil to fetch the lawyer. And the devil shall he be, if horns will make him one. And he's back again. Ah, uh, why, how now, gossip? Why stay there? Stay you there, musing? A toy. A toy runs in my heady face. The pox of that head. Is there more toys yet? What is it, pray thee, gossip? No, oh, I, sir. What if you should slip away now with my wife's best gown? I having no security for it. For that I hope, Dad, you will take our words. Ay, <laughs> by the mass, your word. <laughs> That's a proper staff for wise security to lean upon. But tis no matter. Once I'll trust my name on your cracked credits, let it take no shame. Fetch the winch, Frank. Exit security. I'll wait upon you, sir, and fetch you over. You were ne'er so fetched. Go to the tavern, knight. Your followers dare not be drunk, I think, before their captain. Exit Quicksilver. Would I might lead them to no hotter service till our Virginian gold were in our purses. And exit Sir Petronel. So, yeah, there's a there's a lot of crossing and double crossing going on here in a slightly confusing fashion, which suddenly randomly switches to verse for no readily apparent reason. Um, and yeah, uh, what's going on here? Because actually, I'm slightly confused who's com who's gulling who here. And I don't know how that's whether that's properly coming across in the text or whether it's supposed to properly come across in the text yet. Um, uh, Lois. Yeah, uh, well, it's really a brilliant bit of plotting, and uh, uh, it was quite well expressed by uh, someone writing about this play who says that Winifred is going to be disguised as herself, uh, because <laughs> that's exactly what they've got in mind. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's with Winifred, that is security's wife, that Petronel wants to elope, uh, but they've got uh, security thinking that it's with Bramble's wife. So Brandle's, Bramble's wife is going to be brought aboard wearing uh, uh, Mistress Security's dress. 
Um, it's rather interesting that security was supposed to be quite a rich user has apparently given his wife only two dresses, which yeah. that doesn't seem like an awful lot. Uh, I, again, possibly speaking to the nature of the expectation of his character is that he's not going to spend any money. He's only uh -huh. going to collect it. Yeah. Um, uh, exactly. Sarah, then Alan. No, I was just going to say exactly what uh, Lois has just said. I love the fact that Winifred is effectively going to be disguised as herself. Um, and, and, and the fact that security is taking such joy in the fact that he's Bramble allegedly is going to be the one who's who's cuckolded. I mean, just kind of sets him up as the perfect target because he's he, he just thinks this is a great idea. And it means, you know, he, his wife has to stay at home while he goes gallivanting. So, like, we're just setting him up, up for such a glorious fall here. Uh, Alan. Yeah, I think the issue of the of only having two gowns is quite simply what would now be called controlling behaviour. Mm. <laughs> you know, don't don't give her a second frock, otherwise she'll be looking to go out in it. Mm. But there was also an interesting question that was posed in the chat that um, Mildred was actually on stage for much of that, the mm. earlier part of that sequence. And someone asked the question, well, what she's doing? And I must admit, I've got a... a metal image of her stuffing a hanky in a mouse to stop herself from giggling out loud. <laughs> mm. yes. And the absurdities. Yeah. Uh, yes, there's a lot of a potential action there, but not a lot of words. But then, you know, it's the middle of the play. Maybe, you know, uh, it's 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 nice to have a break. Let everybody else do stuff. Um, I just didn't do an awful lot at the beginning of the play. But anyway, mm. uh, Lynn and then Aliki. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I couldn't really quite follow what was going on, but I didn't mind. <laughs> so that was kind of my <laughs> reaction to that. I'm, like, I, I, I'm not quite sure I follow this, but it's it's funny anyway. Uh, one clarification that I was grateful to get is our Virginia gold isn't going to be in our purses. So that's the point. They're not just running away. I was wondering yesterday, it's just like, and when you get to Virginia, what are you going to do? Do you, you, do you know <laughs> what's going on? But yeah. evidently, either the writers or at least the characters have bought into the myth that the new world is El Dorado and everybody who goes there comes back rich. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be interested to see whether the, the play basically perpetuates that myth or uses that myth um, or whether it debunks that myth. Um, because, yeah. Well, I mean, it's- it, The yeah, lost colony of Roanoke and all that, you know. So, <laughs> um, so we we shall see. We'll, we'll see if they even actually get off the dime. Mm. Yeah, it's a question. Have, has has the con of uh, selling someone a you know the, the uh, uh, a gold mine uh, become yeah. a thing yet? Um, yeah. Or, or yeah. similar thing, you know. It's, it's, it's this but property, clearly, they think that they're going to. Yeah. Well, they've already sold the one lady a castle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they think they're going to make a fortune, come back, pay all their debts. But it it would and, it would be a nice irony though that if uh, you know for the people who've who've sold this mythical castle um, have been themselves <laughs> sold this puff of you know they're they're going off. Here's this this wonderful gold mine that we've uh, you know you're going to yeah. in Virginia. You know that sort of logic uh, yeah. uh, that that is 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 there. Um, Aliki. Without being quite sure how I know this, but there was something in the way that Quicksilver and security were talking in yesterday's session that made me think that they are definitely stealing or cheating. Um, what's his face? Uh, Petronel mm. as well, right? I mean, there, yeah. there's something in that contract that's deeply dishonest. Mm. Oh, so oh, it's yeah. not just, yeah. He is already being cheated by the by the guy whose wife he is um, spiriting away. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing is that you, you have these sort of intersecting cons um, sort of as, as, as orbiting and, and circling each other in that sense. And uh, the reason why I was asking, you know, what, what was sort of going on was, you know, how much of that was coming across just from the text. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure actually in performance, none of that is actually unclear what's going on. Um, but it's just a question of how opaque or, or not that the text was. Again, it's I, I do have occasional explicatory issues with, with, shall we say, one of the authors of this text and who I suspect <laughs> it wrote this bit. Um, Lois. 
Yeah. I mean, the other thing that's going on is security constantly leaving and then coming back when they really don't want him because they're talking behind his back about him. That's mm -hmm. a kind of classic comic trope of character. You think you've got rid of him. Oh, no, here he comes again. And he comes yeah. back again with yet another idea and each idea worse than the last. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. Yes, and and that last exit of security, because um, there's this sort of exit security, and then there's no, there's no mark of his re-entering. But they say, you know, why stay stay you there musing? So he's turned to go, and they've started to do the he he he. But he's actually stopped and sort of done a hmm, thinker's pose, and, uh, and, and 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 as he's thinking, and 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 they've almost caught themselves out. Uh, so there's 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 some nice potential for the comic business there, physically uh, as well as. Uh, the, everything else and it's a nice mirror to the beginning of the scene which was full of people who we will never meet again uh popping in and out um for 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 no readily apparent reason uh at all can't 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 fathom any of that stuff um okay any other thoughts before we move on eric um and then julie it was quite a long scene for um i mean com compared to other stuff that we've seen where you've got like long scenes considering it doesn't do much plot i mean as you explained uh, i don't know it's just intriguing but it's fun so yeah i, I mean it, it for the most part the, the structure of this play has been effectively rolling on scenes that there's one each act is itself a unit there's very few times when the scenes are openly demarcated as everybody exits and then uh, somebody else enters somewhere else it's all it's all sort of flowing action most of the time but yes uh lois yeah, you know, I, I'm so old that I saw this play given in 1964 at the Mermaid Theatre in London. And they, they had this wonderful moment where Gertrude's coach actually came onto the stage and uh, she left with everybody cheering and you know, uh, everybody in raptures about this exciting event because Fond and Gazer are meant to be typical idiotic London citizens for whom just any kind of show is exciting. Mm. Uh, uh, Julie. Oh, oh, I was, this is actually looking forward that drawer is the person who draws the beer and not a drawer. <laughs> it just, I, we encountered it actually when my reading group in the Beggar's Opera just a couple of weeks ago. And so that was kind of fun. Yes. It just, <laughs> that just drawer, that's all. Cool. Um, uh... <laughs> Uh, the absence of visual signifiers. I don't always know when to jump oh. in or out. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. I just don't want to think I'm, I'm playing a character who's just composed of underwear. Mm. Like <laughs> drawers. It can be arranged. <laughs> or um, a bureau. Depends on, depends on the nature of the establishment. Uh, so, <laughs> Uh, so, yes, this is projecting into Act 3, Scene 3, uh, as we have Enter Seagull, Spendall, and Scapethrift. Um, you, you get the impression they had just far too many S's in their Scrabble set there. Um, into the tavern with a drawer. Come, drawer, pierce your neatest hogsheads and let's have cheer. Not fit for your Billingsgate tavern, but for our Virginian colonel. He will be here instantly. You shall have all things fit, sir. Please, do you have any more wine? More wine, slave. Whether we drink it or no, spill it and draw more. Fill all the pots in your house with all sorts of liquor and let them wait on us here like soldiers in their pewter coats. And though we do not employ them now, yet we will maintain them till we do. Said like an honourable captain, you shall have all you can command, sir. Exit drawer. Come, boys. Virginia longs till we share the rest of her maidenhead. Why is she inhabited already with any English? A whole country of English is there, man, bred of those that were left there in 79. They have married with the Indians and make them bring forth as beautiful faces as any we have in England. And therefore the Indians are so in love with them that all the treasure they have, they lay at their feet. Why is there such treasure there, Captain, as I have heard? I tell thee, gold is more plentiful there than copper is with us. And for as much red copper as I can bring, I'll have thrice the weight in gold. Why, man, all their dripping pans and their chamber pots are pure gold. And all the chains with which they chain up their streets are massy gold. All the prisoners they take are fettered in gold. And for rubies and diamonds, they go forth on holidays and gather them by the seashore to hang on their children's coats and stick in their caps as commonly as our children wear saffron gilt brooches and groats with holes in them. And is it a pleasant country withal? Oh, as ever the sun shined on, temperate and full of all sorts of excellent viands. 
Wild boar is as common there as our tamest bacon is here, venison as mutton, and then you shall live freely there without sergeants or courtiers or lawyers or intelligencers. Only a few industrious Scots, perhaps, who indeed are dispersed over the face of the whole earth. No, but as for them, there are no greater friends to Englishmen in England when they are out in, it in the world than they are. And for my part, I would a hundred thousand of them were there. For we are all one countrymen now, you know, and we should find ten times more comfort of them there than we do here. Then, for your means to advancement, there it is simple and not preposterously mixed. You may be an alderman there and never be scavenger. You may be a nobleman and never be a slave. You may come to preferment enough and never be a pander, to riches and fortune enough and have never the more villainy nor the less wit. Besides, there we shall have no more law than conscience and not too much of either. Serve God enough, eat and drink enough, and enough is as good as a feast. God's name, and how far is it hither? Some six weeks sail, no more, with any indifferent good wind. And if I get to any part of the coast of Africa, I'll sail thither with any wind. Or when I come to Cape Finisterre, there's a four-right wind continually wafts us till we come at Virginia. Oh, see, our colonel's come. I think we should just pause there because there's quite a lot to unpack in all of that. Um, <laughs> we were talking about the sort of the the, the question of uh, the the expectation of riches to be found, and uh, we have a, a detailed exposition uh, uh, to to presumably some quite gullible things. Uh, I get it, the hints of potential satire in some of this, um, and it would be fair to say <laughs> um, uh, that that this play did come into did it get into a little hot water uh, over its satirical content, and we. May be getting a few little hints of that here, uh, though there might have been more in the original production than, than it is, is reproduced later on. So if you're looking for the deep satire that upsets the king, um, then uh, or, or, or uh, associate peoples, but uh, never mention the Scots in an in a slightly <laughs> negative fashion. Let's just say that that that's not a 1605. It's not a good time to be doing that, um, Lois. Yeah. Well, this. This actually is one of the places where we, one can see the, the censorship because uh, that particular speech, uh, and especially the whole thing about you may be an alderman there and never be a scavenger, that was actually a profession. That was the lowest rank of sort of civic duties. Uh, but uh, that was cut. And uh, there's a much shorter version of it that appeared in most of the texts. In fact, there's only, I think, about one copy of the, uh, the first issue of the first quarto that enables people to see what was originally uh, published. It's interesting that it, it did get as far as being printed before they realized that this just couldn't be allowed. And, and so it, uh, it's kept. In fact, I th this is a rather peculiar text because I think the, the enough is as good as a feast is actually something that was added to replace the original, um, which I find interesting just because the, whoever was doing this had noticed all the proverbs in the play and thought that sticking in a proverb would at least help. It might have been one of the authors, in fact, doing the, uh, the revision. Mm. Uh, other other thoughts um, beyond just seagull is an excellent opportunity for someone to do a very long speech um, <laughs> and everyone else sit around tell us more tell us more <laughs> um, uh, yeah but uh, setting up a series of uh, stereotypes and uh, and uh, cliches that uh, are um, uh, 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 still some of which uh, survive today um the drivers for colonial expansion. Greed. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, la and, and laziness. It's like you can do all this and not have to work for it. I like, but it's just, I guess people have always been like this, but like, yeah, if it's so easy and so, if like, if utopia <laughs> exists, why doesn't everybody go there? I <laughs> think about it. Like, if this were true, why? Why isn't it, why aren't people lined up to get on a ship to go there? Mm -hmm. uh, Lois. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is that this is actually written before the establishment of the Virginia Company. Uh, it's a very early reference to Virginia, and uh, at this point, most of the references to uh, to foreign travel were quite negative. In fact, it's one of the things that the uh, the various merchants who were backing this kind of venture objected to about the players was that they were constantly satirizing it. Uh, there's a book called The Absence of America, which is uh, quite good on this. Uh, Eric, I think you waved. 
I was just going to say that Seagull reminds me a bit of um, the, the modern equivalent of, well, the early modern equivalent of um, Seahawk from she- like the modern version of Shira, as in um, who basically sings sh- sea shanties all day and does <laughs> nothing when danger is near um, and has a terrible track record of his ships getting set on fire for no apparent reason. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I can go with that. I mean, he's no Captain Pugwash, is he? Uh, 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 okay, any other thoughts? No. Okay, let's carry on the scene. So our colonels come, enter Sir Petronal with his followers. Well met, good Captain Seagull, and my noble gentleman. Now the sweet hour of our freedom is at hand. Come, drawer, us some grouses, and prepare us for the mirth that will be occasioned presently. He will be a pretty wench, gentlemen that will bear us company all our voyage. Whatsoever she be, here's to her health, <laughs> noble colonel, both with pap and knee. Thanks, kind Captain Seagull. She's one I love dearly and must not be known till we be free from those, from all that know us. And so, gentlemen, here's to our health. Let it come, worthy colonel. We do hunger and thirst for it. Before heaven. You've hit the phrase of one that her presence will touch from the foot to a void, if you knew it. Ooh, we have lost your sound. Uh... Mm. Why then, we will join his forehead with your health, sir, and Captain Scapethrift hears to them both. And enter security and bramble. See, see, Master Bramble, for heaven, their voyage cannot but prosper. They are all, they are all their knees to, for success to it. And they pray to God Bacchus. God save my brave colonel with all his tall captains and corporals. See, sir, my worshipful learned counsel, Master Bramble, is come to take his leave of you. Worshipful Master Bramble. How far do you draw us into the sweet briar of your kindness? <laughs> Come, Captain Seagull, another health to this rare bramble that had never a prick about him. I pledge his most smooth disposition, sir. Come, Master Security, bend your supporters and pledge this notorious health here. Bend you yours likewise, Master Bramble, for it is you shall pledge me. Oh, not so, Master Security. He must not pledge his own health. No, Master Captain? Enter Quicksilver with Winifred disguised. Why, then, here's one fitly come to do him that honour. Here is the gentlewoman, your cousin, sir, whom, with much entreaty, I have brought to take her leave of you in a tavern. Ashamed whereof, you must pardon her if she put not off her mask. Pardon me, sweet cousin. My kind desire to see you before I went may be so importunate to entreat your presence here. How now, Master Francis? Have you honoured this presence with a fair gentlewoman? Pray, sir, take you no notice of her, for she will not be known to you. But my learned counsel, Master Bramble here, I hope he may know her. No more than you, sir, at this time. His learning must pardon her. Well, God pardon her for my part. I do, I'll be sworn. And so, Master Francis, here's to all that are going eastward tonight towards Cuckold's Haven. And so to the health of Master Bramble. I pledge it, sir. Hath it gone round, Captain? It has, sweet Frank, and the round closes with thee. Well, sir, here's to all eastward and toward Cuckold's. And so to famous Cuckold's Haven, so fatally remembered. And stands. Hey, pray thee, cuz, weep not. Gossip security. I, my brave gossip. A word, I beseech you, sir. Our friend, Mistress Bramble here, is so dissolved in tears, she drowns the whole mirth of our meeting. Sweet gossip, take her aside and comfort her. Pity of all true love, Mistress Bramble. What? Weep you to enjoy your love? What's the cause, lady? 
It's because your husband is so near and your heart yearns to have a little abused him. <laughs> alas, alas, the offence is too common to be respected. So great a grave hath seldom chanced to so unthankful a woman. To be rid of an old, jealous dotard, to enjoy the arms of a loving young knight, that when your prickless bramble is withered with grief of your loss, will make you flourish afresh in the bed of the lady. Enter drawer. Sir Petronel, is one of your watermen come to tell you it will be flood these three hours, and that twill be dangerous going against the tide, for the sky is overcast, and there was a porpoise ever now seen at London Bridge, which is always the messenger of tempests, he says. A porpoise? What's that to the purpose? Charge him, if he love his life, to attend us. Can we not reach Blackwall? Where my ship lies, against the tide, in spite of tempests. Captains and gentlemen, we'll begin a new ceremony at the beginning of our voyage, which I believe will be followed of all future adventurers. What's that, good colonel? This, Captain Seagull. We'll have our, provi our provided supper brought aboard. Sir Francis Drake's ship that has compassed the world where, with full cups and banquets, we will do sacrifice for a prosperous voyage. My mind gives me that some good spirits of the waters should hold the desert rivers, ribs of her, and be auspicious to all that honour her memory, and will, with like orgies, enter their voyages. Rarely conceited. One health more to this motion and aboard to perform it. He that will not this night be drunk may he never be sober. They compass in Winifred, dance the drunken round, and drink carouses. Sir Petronel and his honourable captains, in these young services, we old servitors may be spared. We only came to take our leaves, and with one health to you all, I'll be bold to do so. Here, neighbour security, to the health of Sir Petronel and all his captains. Uh, you must bend then, Master Bramble. So now I am for you. I have one corner of my brain, I hope, fit to bear one carouse more. Here, lady, to you, that are encompassed there, and are ashamed of our company. Ha, <laughs> ha, by my troth, my learned counsel, Master Bramble, my mind runs so of cuckold's haven tonight that my head runs over with admiration. Uh, but is that not your wife, neighbour? No, by my truth, Master Bramble. Ha ha ha! A pox of all cuckold's haven, I say. Uh, my faith, your garments are exceeding like your wife's. Cuculus non facit monarchum, my learned counsel. Now, not all cuckolds that seem so, no, all seem not that are so. Oh, give me your hand, my learned counsel. You and I will sup somewhere else than at Sir Francis Drake's ship tonight. Adieu, my noble gossip. Good fortune, brave captains. Fair skies, God send you. Farewell, my hearts, farewell. Farewell, our hearts. Gossip. Laugh no more at Cuckold's Haven, gossip. I have done. I have done, sir. Will you lead, Master Brumble? Ha ha ha! Captain Seagull, charge a boat. A boat! A boat! A boat! A boat! A boat! A boat. A boat. Uh, you're in a proper... Oh, sorry. Exempt? Yes, Exuant all but the aurora. You're in a proper taking indeed to take a boat, especially at this time of night and against tide and tempest. They say yet drunken men never take harm. This night will try the truth of that proverb. Exit drawer, and we have a mini little scene, uh, Act 3, Scene 4, Enter Security. What, Winnie? Wife, I say. Out of doors at this time? Where should I seek the gadfly? Billingsgate. Billingsgate? Billingsgate! She's gone with the night! She's gone with the night! Woe be to thee, Billingsgate! A boat! A boat! 
a boat of 400 marks for a boat exit and i think that's where we're putting the interval isn't it um everybody's everybody's off eastward ho um and uh, and they're all calling for boats and i think we'd we'd, we'd put a few more additional eastward hoes into that uh just yeah. just for the sake of versus similitude as we did with westward ho where we were saying we should add a few more westward hoes into that bit um yes a porpoise what's that to the purpose uh <laughs> lewis carroll was nowhere on that <laughs> i'm now wondering is this the first instance of that terrible pun um <laughs> could be um so yes and um we yeah we've, we've got lots of um uh yeah uh very good i i do like the drawer just coming in yeah, the, the the waterman there's gonna be a flood you know we saw a porpoise and that, that's that's absolutely you know that's <laughs> That's that's the worst thing you can see, mate. Um, that's really nice uh, business with the, the the. They're clearly getting drunker. There's songs and dances in here, of course. We don't know what the songs are, um, but you know, there's the, again, boys' company. We haven't had a song for a while. Let's have a song. Um, let's have some carousing. Let's have some drunk acting because drunk acting is always always enjoyable to watch on stage uh, it's never self-indulgent uh, ever. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's. Um, the the the, gull, the gulling of security is is very nicely done and i do love the way the bramble keeps going that really does look like your wife mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really does you know and mm. I, I you could push that a little further actually i think i almost uh, stopped too early uh lynn okay. yeah um yeah i'm gonna do my thing that i do and kind of be negative nelly again um yeah i mean i think it, it in a way um it's funny and it was supposed to be funny where um um security is saying oh don't be sad it's fine it's fine who wouldn't leave an old husband for a young night people it happens all the time don't feel bad um and he doesn't realize he's saying that to his own wife but i mean it, it sort of makes winifred's uh you know her personhood not count i mean if she really feels sad or conflicted or frightened or guilty and is actually weeping um because she's feeling all these things it's like oh yes i'm really more in love with this guy but i'm married and this is the wrong it's so all of that not count it trivializes her emotional experience and i'm kind of uncomfortable with that well i we don't know what winifred is actually doing I mean that's uh, that's the thing. It's uh, security, maybe you know, trying to to, to to to. I mean, it's to make security, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 put himself in trouble. Um, but also, you know, presumably Winifred wants to go. Uh, it's not like Winifred, you know, Winifred is presumably part of this conspiracy, and so this is this is just about making security worse. Uh, you know, and you know, uh, it's it's an interesting question though. Aliki then Sarah. I mean, you could absolutely play it that she's laughing. Mm. Uh, and that would be very funny i think mm. yeah he thinks she's sobbing and actually she's like <laughs> yeah because remember you know i i think the idea so that long. she hates her husband should is, is 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 perfectly legitimate uh within the the text considering what we know of security so far because he's an asshole um and you know to put it lightly uh but then he's he's one of one of several uh yeah. within this area so it's 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 people doing harm to each each other who are all doing harm to each other in, in interesting well, scenarios. Uh, Sarah? Um, I was kind of going to say what Aliki already said. Uh, and you could even have a uh, Quicksilver like whispering in her ear like, oh, come on, let's 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 do this. You know, it'd be funny. Um, and then, yeah, the more she finds it funny, the more she's laughing and the more um, security thinks he, she's crying. I I, just, I feel like Quicksilver. Um, he, he's changed character again. I but no, it's not that he's changed character. Um, but he just he seems to go on and off the boil throughout this play, and I can only assume that that's we've had another switch of writer. Um, because that whole scene was very funny, um, but he barely said anything at all. And I mean, this is very much a Quicksilver scene. And then we didn't get any. I mean. Like the first act, he he. Every time he opened his mouth, he was saying "Eastward Ho." It's like, and now they're actually setting off, and he doesn't say it. And it's like, well, 
I mean, yeah, okay, you could add that in, but like, what was the playwright thinking? What's going on here? Like, this is his little catchphrase, and they're, they're setting off, and he's not saying it. Like, what's happened to him? So, again, I'm, I'm wondering if we've had a, a, a change of playwright here. Um, it was funny, but it just it didn't have that same characterization uh, that that the um, earlier scenes had. Uh, Lois. Yeah, well, there, I think there has been a change of playwright. I mean, the stuff to do with these. Um, Petronel's Security Winifred plot is really Chapman drawing on this Italian novella. And that particular bit where uh, the, the deceived husband is meant to reassure his own wife that it's okay for her to run off with her lover is straight out of the, uh, of the novella. And I think uh, for the purposes of the novella, Quicksilver is really only just there as a kind of supernumerary. I mean, he doesn't have anything to do except that he's brought her there. Uh, uh, the whole Quicksilver is Wild Apprentice thing is part of the uh, the Marston part of the play and the uh, and doesn't really come into this. Uh, if you, I mean, I th I find this mostly just terribly funny. But if you do want to look for something really sinister, I mean, it is the fact that if you can believe any of this, that they're purporting to um, sail all the way to Virginia, which is going to take what at least a month with only one woman on board. Uh, yeah. You know, Petronelle's mistress, but also, you know, what else is she going to be doing? You know, it's really pretty awful to think of what her role is meant to be. Mm. Uh, other thoughts before we we dive into Act Four, uh, which we're going to begin. Um, but yeah, it, it it is interesting how the the. It is quite detectable, the different writing styles, it has to be said. I, I, uh, the, the, certainly between Chapman and I feel that Marston and Johnson, I, I am I am noting differences and sh potential shifts there, um, but they are much more in symp simpatico than I feel that Chapman is. Um, mm -hmm. But that may just be unfair or perfectly fair, depending on your point of view. Um, any other thoughts? I do like security. Winnie. Uh, <laughs> oh no, we're off to Billingsgate. Um, right, uh, let's, uh, Eric. There's a part of me going, is this like more early modern geography where they're going east, but they're actually going west? Because like, you know, Virginia in relation to the UK is west, but then like generally, but I, I don't know if that's just me because I missed the first part of the thing. Well, no, they're going east because they've got to get to the ship. I mean, they're only, they're so far just in little rowboats or something on the Thames, but yeah. they've got to get to Blackwall with this ship, which they're hoping nobody has impounded before they get to it. Uh, is oh, waiting okay, yeah, that makes sense. And they're, you know, they'll have to get to the mouth of the Thames and then go, go around the south of England and, you know, head, yeah. head towards. And yeah. also Eastwood Ho has been used in a slightly different way uh, throughout the text as well, because it potentially is, 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 is talking about uh, the, the court, which is uh, currently settled to the east. That might be one of the things that's going on there. And it also seems to be just a general optimistic phrase of, you know, opportunity that uh, certainly that's how Quicksilver was using it very early on, you know, mm -hmm. in, in a way that actually Westwood Ho sort of becomes as a, as as a thing the idea of going west um becomes becomes that kind of thing uh so that it it's sort of used in a sense exactly in that 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 way as well um but yes geography of london actually hasn't come up as much as i'd expected so far we haven't whereas in westwood ho we were constantly i was constantly sitting there going oh, with the map figure out okay well that's quite a long okay that makes sense to go by boat because that's actually quite a long way and and things whereas we are now going to quite specific locations um mm. uh going forward uh lois yeah i just thought maybe i should mention for those who don't know it i mean cuckold's haven is a definite location they're making all these jokes about it because security thinks he's being terribly funny and referring to it in connection with bramble whom he thinks is being cuckolded but i mean it is a it is a point on the uh on the thames and uh uh, quite significant, as you'll see in the next scene. Mm, yes, uh, it, it, uh, it, it uh, notorious for various activities. It did it, it also have the Horn Fair as well. Um, uh, once, once upon a time, so it's one of those things. You know, those pesky Victorians get it. people mm. having too much fun can't have that. <laughs> um, and this, this, this is another iteration of the same thing. So, Act Four, Scene One. Enter Slitgut, who we've not met before, <laughs> with a pair of ox horns, discovering Cuckold's Haven uh, uh, above. All hail, fair haven of married men only, for there are none but married men, cuckolds. For my part, I presume not to arrive here, but in my master's behalf, a poor butcher of Eastcheap, who sends me to set up, in honour of St Luke, these necessary ensigns of his homage. 
and up I got this morning, thus early, to get up to the top of this famous tree that is all fruit and no leaves, to advance this crest of my master's occupation. Up then, heaven and St. Luke bless me that I be not blown into the Thames as I climb with this furious tempest. Slight, I think the devil be abroad in likeness of a storm to rob me of my horns. Hark how he roars! Lord, what a coil the Thames keeps! She bears some unjust burden, I believe, that she kicks and curvets thus to cast it. Heaven bless all honest passengers that are upon her back now, for the bit is out of her mouth, I see, and she will run away with them. So, so, I, I think I've made it look the right way. It runs against London Bridge, as it were, even full butt. And now let me discover from this lofty prospect what pranks the rude Thames plays in her desperate lunacy. Oh, me! Here's a boat that has been cast away hard by. Oh, alas, alas, see one of her passengers labouring for his life to land at this haven here. Pray heaven he may recover it. His next land is even just under me. Hold out yet a little, whatsoever thou art. Pray and take a good heart to thee. Tis a man. Take a man's heart to thee, yet, yet a little further. Get up at thy legs, man, now tis shallow enough. So, so, so. Well, alas, he's down again. Hold thy wind, father. Tis a man in a nightcap. So, oh, now he's got up again. Now he's past the worst. Oh, yet yeah, thanks be to heaven, he comes towards me pretty and strongly. Uh, enter security without his hat, in a nightcap, uh, wet band, etc. Heaven, I beseech thee, how have I offended thee? Hail my caster, Sean, how? I might go a right away home by land. Oh, let me see. Oh, I am scarce able to look about me. Where is there any sea mark that I am acquainted with all? Look up, father. Are you acquainted with this, Mark? What? Landed at Cuckold's Haven? Hell and damnation! I will run back and drown myself! Security falls down. Poor man. How weak he is. The weak water has washed away his strength. <laughs> Landed at Cuckold's Haven. If it had not been to die twenty times alive, I should never have escaped death. I will never arise more. I will grovel here and eat dirt till I be choked. Oh, I will make the gentle earth do that which the cruel water has denied me. Alas, good father, be not so desperate. But rise, man, if you will, I'll come presently and lead you home. Home? Shall I make any know my home that has no others abroad? How low shall I crouch away that no eye may see me? I will creep on the earth while I live and never look heaven in the face more. Uh, exit security creeping. What young planet reigns now, Trow, that old men are so foolish? What desperate young swaggerer would have been abroad such a weather as this upon the water? I me, see another remnant of this unfortunate shipwreck or some other. A woman, if faith a woman, though it be almost at St. Catherine's, I, I discern it to be a woman, for all her body is above the water, and her clothes swim about her most handsomely. Oh, they bear her up most bravely. Has not a woman reason to love the taking up of her clothes, the better while she lives for this? Alas, how busy the rude Thames is about her. A Pox of that wave, it'll drown her in faith, it'll drown her. Oh, cry God mercy, she escaped it. I thank heaven she escaped it. Oh, how she swims like a mermaid. Some vigilant body, look out and save her. Well, that's well said. Just where the priest fell in, there's one, sets down a ladder and goes to take her up. Oh, God's blessing of thy heart, boy. Now, take her up in thy arms and to bed with her. She's up, she's up. Oh, she's a beautiful woman, I warrant her. The billows durst not devour her. Enter the drawer of the blue anchor with Winifred. Oh. Uh, Julie. Do we have our drawer? How fare you now, lady? Uh, much better, my good friend, than I wish. 
as one desperate of her fame. Now my life is preserved. Comfort yourself. That power that preserved you from death can likewise defend you from infamy, howsoever you deserve it. Were not you one that took boat late this night with a knight that and other gentlemen at Billingsgate? Unhappy that I am, I was. I am glad it was my good hap to come down thus far after you, to a house of my friends here in St. Catherine's, since I am now unhappily made a man to made a mean to your rescue from the ruthless tempest, tempest, which, when you took boat, was so extreme, and the gentleman that brought you forth so desperate and unsober, that I feared long ere this, I should hear of your shipwreck, and therefore, with little other reason, made thus far this way. And this I must tell you, since perhaps you may make use of it. There was left behind you at our tavern, brought by a porter, hired by the young gentleman that brought you, a gentleman gown, hat, stockings, and shoes, which, if they be yours, and you please to shift you, taking a hard bed here in this house of my friend, I will presently go fetch you. Ah, thanks, my good friend, for your more than good news. Uh, the gown, with all things bound with that are mine, uh, which, if you please to fetch, as you have promised, I will boldly receive the kind favor you have offered till your return, uh, entreating you by all the good you have done in preserving me hitherto, to let none take knowledge of what favor you do me, or where such a one as I am bestowed, lest you incur me much more damage in my fame than you have done me pleasure in preserving my life. Come in, lady, and shift yourself. Resolve that nothing but your own pleasure shall be used in your discovery. Thank you, my good friend. Uh, the time may come I shall requite you. And exuant Winifred and Drora leaving Slitgut to continue radio theatre. See, see, see. I hold my life there's some other are taking up at Wapping now. Look, what a sort of people cluster about the gallows there. In good troth it is so. Oh, me, a fine young gentleman. What? And taken up at the gallows? Heaven grant he be not one day taken down there. Oh, my life, it is ominous. Well, he is delivered for the time. I see the people have all left him. Yet will I keep my prospect a while to see if any more have been shipwrecked? And we'll pause before Quicksilver comes on, because um, uh, that's uh, that's a, 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 a fair amount of slick gut who I am... I am loving as our narrator. Um, I mean, it's great. He's, he's casting about in front of the audience. Look, and if we were staging it today, we'd so have them crawling through the audience and climbing onto the stage, you know, rather than coming from, say, a, 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 an indicated entrance uh, point. Um, you know, he, he comes on, does a, a nice little sort of scene setting opening and then gets straight on with the radio theatre. And I absolutely adore adored it it was really fun and you know the descriptions you know oh like a mer you know mermaid um and you know swimming in the thames i, I i'd hate to think uh, how dirty the costumes are when oh. you <laughs> I mean, I if the drawer has jumped in voluntarily and is probably going to die of dysentery. Uh, Aliki. <laughs> I mean, I thought that was a lovely little bit where he said, like, oh, I hope she doesn't drown. Oh, look, somebody's rescued her. That's nice. I didn't have to go in there. Yeah. <laughs> really delightful set of little speeches and keep the special effects budget nicely uh, economical. Yeah. <laughs> mm, absolutely and and it, again it, it for a modern production this is exactly where you want to start your second half i mean it's it's starting mm -hmm. after an interval anyway because there'll be a brief interval uh, in, a, in, a, in an indoor playhouse um but for us it's it's a nice it's setting everything back in motion we've got a new character who's just there to 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 grease the wheels as it were and i just love the way the drawer comes in and just casually explain just explains why she's there <laughs> she's going oh, i had a notion <laughs> awfully convenient and and nice little uh, suggestion that you shouldn't go boating drunk also mm, very <laughs> wise advice lois and then lynn oh yeah um yeah well it would be difficult for uh slip gut to get down and rescue uh Winifred, given that she's at St. Catherine's and he's at Cuckold's Haven, apparently. I mean, they're quite a long way apart. Uh, I mean, one of the funny things in the scene, and which the audience would certainly have realized, is that from Cuckold's Haven, he's looking about two miles, I think, in either direction. At any rate, he's he's got an amazing view of everything. And uh, the only person he can actually hear is security right under him. But part of the joke is that everybody is 
coming ashore in the most appropriate symbolic point. I mean, St. Catherine was where there was a home for uh, abandoned women. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and obviously, uh, uh, Quicksilver is coming ashore, uh, just the sort of place that everybody's constantly saying is going to end up where, where there's a gallows. And, uh, and obviously security at Cuckold's Haven, which he'd just been making all those jokes about, and which he sees as ominous. So the, the whole thing is, is kind of absurd anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Slitgut must have been written for a really good actor. I mean, uh, it's so odd because he has just this one scene. And mm -hmm. the last time, well, not the last time, but when when they did a musical comedy version of this at The Mermaid, which was a disaster in 1982, that part was played by Mark Rylance, in fact. It was one of the earliest things in his career. <laughs> uh, so, mm. yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm just sort of casting about thinking, well, we haven't touched tone sort of dropped out, out of the face of the earth. So may, mm. maybe there's a, or yeah. something like mm. that kind of role. I don't mm. know whether that 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 works with. No, it probably can't. No. Uh, looking at the next scene. Um, yes. But never mind. Never mm. mind. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's potentially there because he's 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 only encompassing a certain number of parts. So it'd be interesting to see what the potential doubling there actually is, because uh, it could be anybody, because I don't think it appears again after this scene he's just here to grease the wheels as it were mm -hmm. lynn it's the we've i think a lot of us have been enjoying the the names of the characters you know petronelle is a firearm and quicksilver and so forth and slit gut is a is a butcher's apprentice or a butcher mm -hmm. but we know but there's no way of the audience knowing his name he never interacts with anybody so mm -hmm. you know they took the trouble to give him this funny name and um and there's no way of the the audience at the time of knowing yeah. so well, it um, might be a costuming signifier, but apart yeah. from that, uh, you're right. But um, yeah, and and of course, if Johnson was was still part of the collaborative process, I think he always had in mind publishing as well. You know, he he went on to publish his own works. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, you know that might have been his decision. It's like, oh, you know, this will reach print eventually, so we need to give him a funny name. It just sort of occurred to me he's got this funny name, and nobody in the audience would know. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, let's uh, let's continue the scene. So uh, we've had uh, uh, Slickgut's introduction to Quicksilver's approach. Uh, enter Quicksilver, bareheaded. A curse that ever I was saved or born. How fatal is my sad arrival here? As if the stars and providence spake to me and said, the drift of all unlawful courses whatever end they dare propose themselves in frame of their licentious policies. In the firm order of lust, just destiny, they are ready highways to our ruins. I know not what to do. My wicked hopes are with this tempest torn up by the roots. Oh, which way shall I bend my desperate steps in which unsufferable shame and misery will not attend them? I will walk this bank and see if I can meet the other relics of our poor shipwrecked crew, and or hear of them. The night, alas, was so far gone with wine and the other three that I refused their boat and took the hapless woman in, in another who cannot be, but be sunk, whatever fortune hath wrought upon the others' desperate lives. Exit Quicksilver. Enter Sir Petronel and Seagull bareheaded. Thanks, Captain. Tell thee, we're cast up on the coast of France. So that I'm not drunk still, I hope. Just remember where we were last night. No, by my troth, knight, not I. But methinks we have been a horrible while upon the water. And in the water. Ay, me, we're undone forever. Is there any money about thee? Not a penny, by heaven. Not a penny betwixt us and cast ashore in France. Faith, I cannot tell that. My brains nor mine eyes are not mine own yet. Uh, enter two gentlemen. Would well, not believe me. I know it by the elevation of the pole and by the altitude and latitude of the climate. See, here comes a couple of French gentlemen. I knew we were in France. Does thou think our Englishmen are so Frenchified that a man knows not whether he be in France or in England when he sees them? What should we do? We must lean to them and entreat some relief of them. Might be sweet, and we have no other means to relieve our lives now but their charities. Pray you, do you beg on them then? You can speak French. 
Monsieur le Président, avoir peut-être un autre compte et fortune. Je suis un pauvre chevalier en tant que la terre qui a souffert le fortunat de navrage. Un pauvre chevalier dans la terre? Oui, monsieur. Il est trop vrai. Mais vos gains beyond nos sommes tout sujet à la fortune. Uh, a poor night of England, a poor night of Windsor, are you not? Why speak you this broken French when you're a whole Englishman? On what coast are you, thank you? On the coast of France, sir. Oh, on the coast of dogs, sir. You're the Isle of Dogs, I tell you. I see you've been washed in the Thames here, and I believe you were drowned in a tavern before, or else you would have never have took boat in such a dawning as this was. Farewell, oh, farewell, we will not know you for shaming of you. Can the man well? He's one of my 30 pound knights. Oh no, this is he that stole his knighthood of the Grand Day for four pound given to the page. All the money is in his purse, I will well. And exuant the two gentlemen with their satire with them. Oh, death, Colonel, I knew you were overshot. Sure, I think now, indeed, Captain Seagull, we were something overshot. Into Quicksilver. What, my sweet Frank Quicksilver? Dost thou survive to rejoice me? For what? Nobody at thy heels, Frank? Indeed. What has become of poor Mistress Security? Faith, quite gone quite from her name as she is from her fame, I think. I left her to the mercy of the water. Let her go, let her go. Let us go to our ship at Blackwall and shift us. Nay, by my troth, let our clothes rot upon us and let us rot in them. Twenty to one, our ship is attached by this time. We set her not under sail this last tide. I ne'er looked for any other. Woe, woe is me. What shall become of us? The last money we could make, the greedy Thames has devoured. And if our ship be attached, there is no hope can relieve us. What night? What an unknightly faintness transports thee. Let our ship sink and all the worlds that's without us be taken from us. I hope I have some tricks in this brain of mine. Shall not let us perish. Oh, well said, Frank of Faith. Oh, my nimble spirited Quicksilver. For God, would thou it's been our colonel. I like his spirit rarely, but I see no means he has to support that spirit. Go to night. I have more, more means than thou art aware of. I have not lived amongst goldsmiths and gold makers all this while, but I have learned something worthy of my time with them. And not to let and not to let thee stink where thou stands, knight. I'll let thee know some of my skill presently. Do, good Frank, I beseech thee. I will blanch copper so cunningly that it shall endure all proofs but the test. It shall endure malleation, it shall have the ponderosity of Luna and the tenacity of a Luna, by no means freeable. Blight, when lettest thou these terms, Trow? <laughs> Tush, Knight, the term of this art every ignorant quack salver is perfect in. But I'll tell you how you, your, how you how yourself shall blanch copper thus cunningly. Take arsenic, otherwise called Rialga, which indeed is plain rat's bane. Sublime them three or four times, then take the sublimant of this realga and put them into a glass, into chimia, then let them have a convenient decoction, natural, four and twenty hours, and he will become perfectly fixed. Then take this fixed powder and project upon him well-purged copper at habebis, Magisterium. Excellent, Frank. Excellent, Frank. Let, Let us hope me. thee. Hey, I will do this besides. I'll take you off 12, I'll take of you 12 pence from every angel with a kind of aqua fortis and never deface any part of the image. But then will it, it will want weight. You shall restore it thus. Take your sal acume prepared and your distilled urine and let your angels lie in it but four and 20 hours and they shall have their perfect weight again. Come on now, I hold this is enough to put some spirit in your in the livers of you. I'll infuse more another time. We have saluted the proud air long enough with our bare sconces. Now will I have you to a wench's house of mine in London. There make shift 
to shift us and after take such fortunes as the stars shall assign us. No, no to what rang. We will never adore, adore thee. thee. Exuant Quicksilver, Sir Petronel, and Seagull enter drawer with Winifred new attired. Now, sweet friend, you have brought me near enough your tavern, which I desired I might with some colour be seen near, inquiring for my husband, who, I must tell you, stole thither the last night with my wet gown uh, we have left at your friends, uh, which, to continue your former honest kindness, let me pray you to keep close from the knowledge of any. And so, with all vow of your requital, let me now entreat you to leave me to my woman's wit and fortune. All shall be done, you all shall be done you desire, and so all the fortune you can wish for it attend you. Now exit drawer. Enter security. I will once more to this unhappy tavern before I shift one rag of me more, that I may there know what is left behind, and what news of their passengers. I have bought me a hat and band with the little money I had about me, and made the streets a little leave, staring at my nightcap. Oh, my dear husband, where have you been tonight? All night abroad at taverns, robbed me of my garments, and fair as one that run away from me. Alas, is this seemly for a man of your credit, of your age, and affection to your wife? What should I say? How oh, miraculously sought this! Uh, oh, was not I at home and called thee last night? Uh, yes, sir. The harmless sleep you broke. And my answer to you would have witnessed it, if you had had the patience to have stayed and answered me. But your so sudden retreat made me imagine you were gone to Master Bramble's, and so rested patient and hopeful of your coming again, till this your unbelieved absence brought me abroad with no less than wonder to seek you where the false knight had carried you. <laughs> Villain and monster that I was, how have I abused thee? I was suddenly gone indeed, for my sudden jealousy transferred me. I will say no more but this, dear wife. I suspected thee. Did you suspect me? Oh, talk not of it, I beseech thee. I am ashamed to imagine it. I will home, I will home. And every morning, on my knees, ask thee heartily forgiveness. Exuant Security and Winifred leaving us with Radio Slickout. <laughs> now will I descend my honourable prospect, the farthest seeing sea mark of the world. No marvel, then, if I could see two miles about me. I hope the Red Tempest's anger be now overblown, which, sure, I think heaven sent as a punishment for profaning Holy St. Luke's memory with so ridiculous a custom. Thou dishonest satire, farewell to honest married men. Farewell to all sorts and degrees of thee. Farewell, thou horn of hunger that calls the inns of, inns of courts to their manger. Farewell, thou horn of abundance that adornest the headsman of the commonwealth. Farewell, thou horn of direction, that is the city lanthorn. Farewell, thou horn of pleasure, the ensign of the huntsman. Farewell, thou horn of destiny, the ensign of the married man. Farewell, thou horn tree, that bearest nothing but stone fruit. And exit Slitgart. Um, so... Uh, yes, we have lots of uh, thing lo again. Lots of things happening in this scene. It's 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 a wonderful sort of array of stuff. I uh, going all the way back to uh, uh, Quicksilver uh, uh, and Sir Petronel um, coming on after that. Uh, Sir Petronel bit. The, I I do love the going up to two Frenchmen <laughs> 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 and talking French to them, going yeah, and the Frenchman just going. But we're in England. <laughs> um, we're not even out of the Thames. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really did you think you'd gone that far i mean how drunk were you um and so yeah so that's, that's a delightful little bit which again is just throwing in a little bit of dangerous satire of the time uh we've mentioned this many many times on these sessions that uh uh james uh basically sold knighthoods um and uh yeah that's something he was doing quite a lot of the time so uh just 
giving it to Sioux French people, I suppose that you can get away with it there. You won't get your your your, no, your, your nose or your ears slit for that, I'm sure. Uh, Lois. Yeah, well, those guys aren't French, of course. They're English, and uh, uh, they're uh, one of them. Maybe. Well, he seems to be to uh, go putting on a Scots accent. I cannot yeah. feel. You know, uh, this is the bit that uh, some people think, anyway actually looked like an impersonation of James himself, which would have been extremely uh, risky. I'm not really sure that, you know, even at the worst, these traumatists would have dared do that. But uh, there were quite a lot of Scots lords who did have the power to confer knighthoods. I mean, you could buy that uh, apparently as a, uh, as a power because people had to pay for the knighthood. So you got it back in fees. Uh, and that may be what they're getting at, because I think the, I mean, the person who who actually sort of denounced Johnson and the rest of them uh, to the Privy Council was in fact a gentleman of the bedchamber or uh, someone whose brother was a gentleman of the bedchamber. And so all this stuff about the court and panderism and um, selling knighthoods would have uh, uh, certainly struck them as offensive. And then of course, indirectly the King who apparently was pretty furious too when he heard about it. Mm. So yeah, this is perhaps the, the potentially the most incendiary <laughs> bit of the play. Yes, but especially when you're bringing up, you know, mentioning Isla Dogs in passing, you know, because Isla Dogs is, is, is mm. a title of a play that also similarly went very badly wrong for Johnson um, yeah. et al. So it's 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 interesting sort of multi layer to that. And it's also the possibility that you know, if, the, if the boys went for it and, you know, the, the boys just decided to do a Scots because they thought it was amusing because they're mm. boys yeah. um, uh, and don't appreciate necessarily the complexity of the situation um, mm. and therefore potentially dobbing them in it um, mm. even more. More so yeah. than the text was doing. Mm -hmm. Could be. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I was thinking that this bit with the sort of the sort of fake French accents and stuff certainly did a lot better job of explaining itself rather than like the fun part of that. Uh, sort of, you're in England. Um, did a, a better job of that than um, the scene we got in like the case is altered where you've got like the hat switching and stuff and it's, like all that weird like had gestury things that we did not get like a note of, which I feel sad about, but um, that was a good scene as well. Um, yeah, slip gut, radio slip gut is a good one. <laughs> I kind of feel like you need to extract this and use it somewhere. Yeah, because it, it keeps the it keeps the scene moving on and 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 dancing and and it's that lovely bit that at the end he does sort of acknowledge that he can see you know I can see for two miles apparently it's really, I'm really good at this uh, it's good, yeah. um, so he, he acknowledges the absurdity of what he's doing there, um, uh, Lynn. Um, you know I think the fact that Quicksilver has a a, a soliloquy in verse. Um, wherein he says it's as if providence is telling me that that you know this that evil plans will always come to no good um and then um immediately almost gets back with his friends and says okay i know how to counterfeit money <laughs> and, and counterfeiting is actually a very serious crime um I mean, I assume it was. It's an extremely oh, yeah. serious offense mm. uh, in the U.S. Yeah. now. So yeah, they um, all have been executed um, for it. Yeah, I mean, they're basically so, talking about shaving coins, right? Yeah, like and, making copper pass for gold. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, so, and, and yeah. yeah. So I, you know, my my guess, you know, from a reading perspective, is that that monologue was written by one author, and then the scene is picked up by somebody else. But of course, you wouldn't know that on stage so i wonder what the effect would be of him seeming to grow a conscience it's like oh it's oh, providence is telling me what a screw up i am and then like oh god you guys are okay okay no it's not desperate i know how to counterfeit <laughs> what? Mm. what does that what kind of character are you building there I, well, I mean, I you, you have the get, the get out that quicksilver is is <laughs> is going to change the every every few seconds so um <laughs> that you have yeah. a bit of get out there um and it is interesting that uh just that whole scene we could unpack that in so many different ways about what is actually going on with the, the talking about counterfeiting how much of that is accurate you know bits of that are, 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 are accurate things um but then there's also sort of absurdity thrown into it as well and so there's it's a really interesting mix 
interesting also for the question of what one uh, how much of that lands for us today as well and you know how again we you know even you know satirical gags at the time you know do we do we substitute a different uh, mo uh, recently uh, uh, or soon to be um, a, a, a crowned monarch um, a, 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 a gags in, in in place of the ones for the the, the then recently crowned monarch um, so it's an interesting question what 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 one does uh, Aliki. I was wondering what all that horns business at the end of, I mean, I can get a cuckold joke, sure. The horn of plenty, yes, horn of poverty, but five horns, six horns, mm. what's all that about? Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, he's obviously got his own horns and he's, he's, I think he's just running with the horn, ho as many horns as he can horn in, um, <laughs> as it were, he'll shoehorn them all, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get into that, that, that groove, uh, Lois. Yeah, I mean, there was, for example, I think they did sound a horn at the inns of court when it was dinner time. So that horn of hunger he talks about. And then I think the horn of abundance that adorns the headsmen of the Commonwealth, that's a sort of double joke that uh, the usual thing that the city fathers are all cuckolds because their wives are having affairs with young gallants, as we've already seen in Westward Ho, or at least trying to. And uh, so they're headsmen in, in two senses. Uh, uh, and the city lantern. Again, I think most of this is... Uh, is jokes about, and of course the ensign of the Huns, huntsman, hunting horn. Uh, yeah, I mean he's he's just riffing on the the idea of horns and stone fruit. Well, there's an obvious pun there too. Uh, yes, from the, the <laughs> horn tree. Um, I, I'm, I can't I can't imagine. Yeah, the, how you draw that. I I, I can't I can't think. Um, Eric, and then Julie. Yeah, I think Julie had a point. Too. Oh, good, Julie. Then oh. Eric. I just wanted to carry on because the, I I like that that it seems like since they can't really soak everybody and put them back on stage to show that they've been shipwrecked, they're all missing their hats. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, you lose your hat in the storm and then rush up on beach, but um, and and then and then suddenly we also get to see, um, the uh, usurer talking about running around having to buy a hat because he was out in his nightcap <laughs> to to so so that he could be respectable while looking for his wife it's like okay dude go home get your hat <laughs> he was just so panicked he had to buy one i guess uh uh eric then lois and then alan or borrow um I was just going to say that um, the bit that uh, Lynn mentioned about Quicksilver's monologue, where like, what am I going to do, Providence and so on, uh, made me think of like the producers, uh, where you've got them like sort of, we repent, we totally repent, and then end up in prison, like, you know, making a whole musical number in Sing Sing and stuff. Um, it's just kind of that vibe, I guess. Like, the, they did just go back to doing whatever they were doing, even if they repent. Mm -hmm. Well, the the uh, the implication with security when he's talking to his wife is that you know bec because you know she didn't let him in you know that you have to be let into your house you know you don't necessarily go out with keys servants mm -hmm. or someone in the household actually has to let you in um, and so maybe he couldn't actually get back into his house because um, or that that there's a sort of almost implication I'm assuming it's just simply it was just too far away he just needed to grab a hat quickly mm -hmm. and that was an important mm -hmm. thing for him. Um, but uh, yeah, that certainly seems to be part of what happened when he's talking to Winifred directly. Uh, um, mm -hmm. And of course, she plays on that, going, "Well, I, I was about to get up, but you you went away in a half. I mean, you know, what am I going to do?" Um, I'm liking Winifred here, a character <laughs> who hasn't said an awful lot in this play. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, nice, uh, Lois and Alan. Yeah, you know the clothing here. Um, I spent ages trying to work this out because, as we know, um, Winifred has only two gowns and. Uh, She's wearing one aboard ship, which obviously gets totally soaked. In fact, uh, Quicksilver and Petronel and everybody thinks she's drowned. And Quicksilver has been incredibly heartless. I mean, he he went off in a boat with her and then just sort of left her to the mercy of the waves. He didn't attempt to save her life um, and uh, tells Petronel that she's drowned. And possibly that line of let her go is because Petronel does react. I mean, as you would expect, I mean, his mistress has just been drowned. My God, you know, and then uh, they, ah, never mind, you know, we, we, we've got enough problems. Uh, and uh, so there's another dress, which is the one that uh, Quicksilver presumably has brought, which he's going to put on. Um, what's really weird, actually, and it only occurred to me at a late stage with this play, is that 
anybody who runs into Mrs. Bramble is going to be really surprised <laughs> because uh, obviously security must think that she has drowned if he believes any of this uh, story. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and uh, the whole clothing thing. I mean, uh, it's also very odd that security would be wearing a nightcap. I mean, he's just been in the tavern and then we, mm. we see him, uh, if he is trying to get into his house, he's certainly not wearing a nightcap then. Mm. If it makes any sense, he must have gone back into the house and got ready for bed and then wondered where his wife was, which doesn't make sense either. Um, but uh, the, the clothing in this play is really quite peculiar if you try to follow it. Mm. Is yes, is this a, a, a well? I mean, I was going to say, is this a confusion between the collaborators? But the thing is, the collaborators are swapping. It's not like collaborators are doing, you know, this scene here, this scene mm -hmm. there, this scene there. There, there. There's clearly shifts in in writing style several mm -hmm. times in a scene. Um, yeah. It's a really, really densely uh, worked. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. schedule as to who's doing what so mm -hmm. that i say th throughout this scene we we have danced between all three collaborators but or it seems we have and s most of the scenes we've done have done that on some level so it's not it's not like they're not talking to each other because they must be talking to each other mm. um in a very active way um mm. uh, alan yeah i mean the, the one that quite interested me was that counterfeiting bit that <laughs> Uh, came out at length because there was a program recently on television in the UK. Eight months previously. Which to this looked, video going out. Yeah, which which looked at the probably still on iPlayer, frankly. Yeah, the debasement of coinage under Henry VIII, and they replicated the method, and it was very similar to what was described above there. Yeah. Um, and what gave it away was the fact when the coin was hammered the king's face was shown on the coin and over time the gold which the chemical processes bring to the surface wore away and you got a red nose which is why henry the eighth was colloquially known as old copper nose uh yeah so the the, the the yeah there's definitely details in here that are accurate yeah. i mean there's also stuff that is uh, clearly just sort of made up for for effect um and and it's yeah and it's a question of how much we actually need we would need in a modern production how much of that is necessary you know it's it's that that question of how much do you keep how much do you you throw away to make it uh you know land because sometimes you can just have too much detail flying at you uh with something like this because you're you're constantly having to sort of pass what something means what something means uh which is fine when you're only doing a little bit but when you've got a lot of it it's uh it's a lot more of a problem um any other thoughts on this uh the the, the i say the the winifred talks her husband round and he's uh every, every morning on his knees ask her forgiveness <laughs> and um i i feel that was a good resolution so far to that 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 that, that, that strand of the plot um uh and once again we're in this situation where there's not much consummation going on anywhere uh we had this to a degree uh, less degree with Westwood Ho as well. There was an awful lot of naughty goings on being mm. planned, but nobody ever really consummated anything, uh, mm. or, uh, or at least not not during the timeline of the play. Um, Lois. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably right, but uh, Petronel does tell security that he's already enjoyed the bed of the woman he's in love with, but then he's talking about Mistress Bramble, uh, mm. and uh, it doesn't look as if he's actually uh, had any kind of sex with the with uh, security's wife because I don't see how he could since he she's kept pretty much under guard uh, so that's probably true that there hasn't been any consummation of anything I mean apart from maybe whatever uh, uh, Gertrude and Quicksilver may have got up to in the in the attic some years back mm. he refers to their playing much columns yeah but then that, that is is that an actual thing or is that just uh, yeah. is that just something that one of those gertrude <laughs> sayings which doesn't yeah. Yeah, she, she doesn't know what it means yeah. <laughs> i mean you know the, I, I i'd be quite curious to know what gertrude thinks sex is actually mm. um yeah because i'm not i'm not right. I'm, she's very keen on it but i'm not mm. sure she really knows what it is yeah. um uh lynn well Cindify is is actually a, a sex worker, isn't she? Basically, mm. possibly. So, I mean, again, that you'll well, you'll see later. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. More to come. More to come. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, it's a dense text. There's a lot of it. Um, More to come. Is that another character? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be. I was thinking it that. could be. Uh, it's, it's certainly on a level with many of the puns that we've got mm -hmm. uh, going on here. Uh, OK, well, it's time for some final thoughts from around the room. Uh, many of us here last time, some of us here only for this session. Um, we had some issues with the latter end of last session, but I, I feel that everything's evening out on the scales. We've, we've had a lot to enjoy here today um, and stuff that is is now t picking up stuff from the previous session and, and running with it whereas some of the setup uh for some things were were, were more laborious than than enjoyable uh and we already had some thoughts on things we might trim for clarity um and also just to take some of the the un more unfortunate darknesses um than perhaps intended by the authors um uh so yeah how are we feeling about it so far today and uh and i say where where do we where does the the, the knife come in terms of uh, trimming this back? It is a little long, so and and there's a question of how much of a city comedy uh, lands today. How much is what details might be just a little bit too much? Um, but you know, people can go out there and do it uncut. It's entirely up to you. Um, but you might have to you know it it, it might be quite a long evening uh, if you do that um so yeah uh final thoughts around the room i'll go to sarah first i think i went to you last last time yes i i enjoyed today uh a great deal um in terms of cuts i think fillet just filleting really i i, I felt that the second half of the first session so that would be act two or oh, the second half of act two i felt that dragged um so you could do probably quite a bit of judicious flitting there because really there's not i think you said this yesterday rob or somebody said it that there wasn't really a lot of the exposition you could you could make the exposition quite short you know the, the things that needed to be said um were kind of bulked out by a lot of other stuff that I, I for me personally didn't really work so yeah today not so much like so I think this would be like more what do you what do you call it Rob salami fillets or something where you're making like like very thin cuts here and there um to sort of tighten it all up and and make it faster but there's the characterization did come back. I mean, yeah, Quicksilver's a weird one because he does change. He does seem to change from scene to scene, but I mean, he is called Quicksilver, so yeah, I suppose. Um, I do. I did like the um, the development of the security plot. I I have to say, and I mean, if I was, um, I don't know if you could do it entirely. Um, I don't know if you could remove all references to him being a usurer. Um, and just kind of have him as a sort of, you know, bit of a old goat merchant in the city. But if you could, I think that would be the way to go with him because the whole kind of cuckolding plot that kind of doesn't actually happen but leaves him all penitent and like, you know, sort of, um, you know, kind of wandering around after his wife begging for forgiveness. I just thought that was really funny. I, the, the whole thing was just really great. And it, I, I'm slightly uncomfortable about his character, but I think if you could trim enough uh, to sort of um, put a different spin on who he is as a, as a person, then that could actually, you know, that would just only add to the fun of it um because it was just such a great plot line and it's interesting that it's been wrapped up already because we've still got a third of the play to go so i'm interested to see what we're going to get in the final third uh lynn any final thoughts yeah um I, I definitely agree with sarah about the the cutting it's a really really busy play so i think one alternative would be to kind of just like take out a whole plot line but i don't know that i would do that because kind of what makes this play this play what 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 gives it its 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 character is the busyness is the so many different characters and so many different plot and several different plot lines and um and they and they do seem to be woven together pretty skillfully um so yeah those little cuts like the very beginning very top of the the play that we did yesterday it really, really takes way too long to get round to it. Um, 
And today, like the pub scene, the pub scene goes on for too long. Um, the pub scene just goes on for too long. The point is, um, they're, they, Winifred is escaping from her not terribly happy marriage with security. I mean, yeah. Um, and the and the two guys who land on the Isle of Dogs and think they're in France. That scene takes too long. Yeah, we get the gag. So yeah, I I think with a lot of work and be like, ah, oh, like we're going to shorten this line, shorten that line. And because so much of it is in prose, that's not going to be as hard as it could be. It's it's harder to edit down verse and keep the uh, and and uh, keep the pentameter sounding the way it should. Uh, but I'm, I'm really curious, like how it shakes out. Kind of can't make up my mind whether I want Quicksilver to get his comeuppance or not. I kind of feel a little bit bad for Gertrude being married to Sir Petronel, who's such a loser. Uh, so um, the, I don't, not sure what would constitute a satisfying ending for me for uh, a lot of these characters. I mean, I hope the invisible Golding and Gertrude. Golding and Mildred do all right. Um, but I'm not sure what I would feel is a, a, a fitting ending for these um, these more reprobate characters, but I am really curious. Mm, yes, I mean, the, 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 we, we, we're not getting across the physicality and this again, especially with Boys Company's plays, there's, there's going to be a physicality and physical business built in much more because there's, there's, there seems to be more of an opportunity to actually rehearse and, and build sequences mm -hmm. like that. So there's an awful lot of visual material here um, uh, uh, that, that can be played on. Um, uh, Julie, mm -hmm. any final oh. thoughts? Well, one thing I wanted to add about the tavern scene is it also is pretty vital that everybody's completely off their butts with drink because otherwise they wouldn't go out on the boat right away so that that they they do go on about it a little bit too much but um but yeah that's that's a big thing i've been picturing quicksilver almost like talking like the two angels on his shoulder you know the bad angel and the good angel and sort of this change of aspect when he does the bad things yeah. as if he's contemplating the worst he can do and then be like yeah maybe and then oh i could be good yeah maybe you know i almost feel sometimes he just needs to roll a dice to decide you know he's got a little dice there. do evil things do nice things do, flip do, a do, coin do, do you know yeah he's just he's just literally just uh, uh going from random random things to random things um uh carolyn any final thoughts uh this section of this play made a whole lot more sense to me hearing it read by experts and hearing everybody's sort of input and commentary on it so i learned a lot from this one from from everybody's input otherwise it would have made zero sense to me and i would have had no idea what was going on it, it, it's so, not an which, easy one to unpack as a read is it <laughs> yeah i was going to say that implies that it means that there's going to be a lot more work that's going to need to make it make it intelligible to people who are watching it possibly because I needed all that to make it intelligible to me. Yeah, I, and I think that's that is the challenge with city comedies is to you know recreate that world with enough things that are going to land for modern people today, and you know clarify that world. And and uh, you know because the energy's there, the world is there. Building the world is 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 great, but um, uh, keep keeping keeping people with it, uh, it is perhaps going to be harder. Um, and and I did really like slit guts narration. I thought that was hilarious. So don't cut that bit. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> I, I don't think. I mean, even though on the page it looks like those are massive speeches, they really aren't. Um, and, they're, and they're really they're really dynamic. They're theatrical because they're playing with the audience in a very active way. It's, look, you know, there's a bit over there. There's a bit over there. Oh, he's coming through the water now. Uh, they're swimming like you know. It's 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 delightful stuff. On that note, I will go to Alex next. Uh, slit guts in per incorporated. Yeah, I love that as a as a theatrical device. It's so it's so neat and so simple. Um, I really I, I wish I'd been here yesterday because I I find this type of large ensemble comedy really interesting. Um, it was really interesting. I think following up uh, something that you were saying, Rob, and also Lois about um, the awareness of characters on stage with things like innuendo and who controls the audience. The audience is such an important element in this as it is in panto um 
Uh, yeah, the, I mean, I love these ensemble comedies, whether they're sort of Congreve or whether they're Carry On, and uh, these remind me so much of of Carry On movies that you have that ensemble, you have people almost dictated by their names, that even the really tiny parts have a very strong character and a name it was interesting hearing about no consummation during the course of the play which is pretty much every carry-on film there's lots of sniggering about sex there's lots of promised sex in the future there's lots of sex that might have happened in the past but no one actually does the nasty during the the the, the, the movie um also those visual and physical elements that are very if you looked at the script of the carry-on film you'd kind of go what the hell is this rubbish when you see the slapstick pieces integrated into it it sort of makes sense um, they were also written collaboratively, you know, like uh, Frank Muir pilfered from Dennis Norden, who pilfered from Talbot Rothwell, and they all sort of circulated the the same jokes. Um, and those problematic elements that you have to kind of you have to kind of iron out of them. So I think this is definitely very stageable. Um, I, I think again, I can only go on the strength of this bit that I've I've sort of heard read today. But I think for me, it would be more reducing the amount of of stuff in one speech that is very uh, period or location um specific rather than chopping out parts because i think um uh, like uh, lynn was saying about the business the business is what i love about these ensemble films it's why i love carry on loving even though it's not a terribly brilliant film is that there are so many plot strands um that then come together at the end in a stupid high fight um but there are all these little minor characters who have tiny little scenes and they all sort of feed in and out of one another. So if you're kind of bored of one plot, you get another one coming along um, soon. And I love that. And I, I'm I'm interested to see where it goes um, yeah. tomorrow. I, I, <laughs> some of those things come in staging is that you don't actually have to cut things, but it's a matter of how much you you persuade the audience to focus on it. It's, mm. it's things that you just throw away and stuff you say, no, you need to listen to this bit, um, you know, without doing it like that but you know um that there are ways and means that you can keep uh, a certain amount of uh, the, the the detail in the world but without lingering on it um uh, and you you just let it go by and, and and get the audience comfortable with the idea that actually they they don't need to pay attention to all of the bits they just need to pay attention to the bits that matter uh easier said than done i'm just <laughs> gonna say <laughs> <laughs> but it is two of them. Uh, Alan, any final thoughts? Yeah, and I think I was somewhat down yesterday because much of Act Two just felt to me to be padding. Um, this one, this act, or well, the act and a bit we've done today, has certainly got the pace back up and the interest back up, plus some gags, um, plus the gratuitous um, smut that the boys' company were almost contractually obliged to put in. Um, and there's not that many places that I've actually sort of drifted off from it today. Mm. Uh, Eric, any? Uh, you've only been here today. Any final thoughts? Yeah, for, the, like, I think for the, like, about three quarters of that first scene we did, I had no idea what was going on, but then Lois, lovely, it was lovely and explained it. Um, but, um, yeah, my focus is not the best today. But uh, it feels like one of those, like, I mean, in many of these plays that we've read so far with comedies, especially we've had this thing of like, it has to go fast or else it won't be funny. And obviously the faster it gets, the funnier it will be. Uh, because then you end up like sort of somehow in act three, uh, scene four or something with like, or act four or whatever, uh, with like split gut sort of trying to work out how on earth did they get here? Why can I see two miles? This is amazing, but why am I here? And it's just like, how did we get here? Um, is it, you, you could just savor that moment or you could just like throw it away and move on. Um, it's, I, I, I kind of enjoy these kind of comedies, especially the sort of plays on words, of course, um, because the physical business is always fun. Mm. Uh, Aliki, any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, I know we, we've all celebrated Slit Cut, but I just want to say you could take that whole bit out and, and just put it on its own in an evening of, you know, bits of plays that you might not know. And it would stand really well. You don't really know a need to have exactly the back plot of who all of these people are. It's it's lovely. I loved it. And generally, I think this would so, so reward um, some workshopping and a whole lot of physical business and 
tightening those entrances and exits and all of the physical it it, 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 would, it would absolutely sing on stage i'd love to do it mm. uh lois any final thoughts well i very much enjoyed hearing it so well read uh you can see why uh, it has been revived at various times and uh, uh, and quite successfully. I think some of you have seen the the last production. What was it, uh, two thousand five at uh, 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 at the Swan in Stratford, and then again in London. Uh, yeah, I mean, lovely characterizations and and actually most of the darker things or the inconsistencies that we've found are not really the kind of thing you would notice. I think just watching it in the theater because there's just so much going on and. Uh, uh, the interweaving of the uh, the sort of security plot with the uh, Touchstones apprentices and daughters plot uh, is really pretty cleverly done. I mean, uh, it, it seems as if some of them have dropped out for ages, but actually this goes by pretty fast and it, uh, it isn't really like that. Um, no, I think that there's obviously room for loads of, of extra business in it to to illustrate uh, what I mean. Quicksilver could do a, practically a magic trick, I think, with while talking about alchemy. You know, I'll, you, you do this and then you do this. You know, you you could uh, easily produce a coin that suddenly looked amazingly gold and totally unconvincing. Uh, and uh, I mean, a lot of the, those long speeches, I think, are kind of double talk or people pretending to know something that they don't. Uh, and then there, there are traditional uh, gags like the, I, I think it's usually called the biter bit, you know, the, the person who thinks he's deceiving somebody who is actually being deceived himself, which is very funny. And the, uh, the story that Chapman was using for the security cuckolding plot uh, actually does end with the, the wife and her lover sailing away and never being seen again. So that the ending where she turns the tables on her husband and uh, gets back with him is their idea, although it's a pretty familiar device as well. You know, the, uh, no, I'm not deceiving you, you're deceiving me, yeah, you know, and uh, it's all your fault. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, yes, it's been, a, it's been a journey so far and it's going to end uh, with the final session. And will we have the curse of the final session is the question. Uh, will it all land? Um, it, it's yes, it, it's it, this, this play has had a very successful uh, uh, performance history and adaptation and uh, and uh, it, even in, into modern times. So it it, it, it it has a sort of continual stage presence on some some level um, throughout. So it's definitely got an energy that people are def definitely taking things from and enjoying. Um, I have got the rsc cut somewhere i will have a little skim through it to see what they once we finish this uh to see what uh, what what made it and what didn't uh because i am curious now uh eric I, I was just gonna say that that first scene we started with today with you know act three scene two it felt a bit like it felt very modern because like all the entrances and exits that uh we were mentioned just like sort of it was like they were going through a revolving door people were coming in saying a line and then leaving coming in saying a line leaving it was just very quick so that's part of what makes the fun in a comedy and trying not to hit other people on the way out obviously mm -hmm. yes know which door you're exiting from when somebody is entering um uh, it's, it's it's just like in a restaurant there, there's there's an indoor and there's an outdoor uh anyway uh, all that remains uh, uh, before our final session is to thank all these wonderful readers for their wonderful reading. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. Mm -hmm. I have seen a little prick. <laughs>